FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's June 4th, 2018. Well, if you're involved in the show, if you enjoy participating, send us an email. We're going to read some questions, uh, John Rabino and I, during this segment. Again, for your reference, kl at kerrylutz.com. So it's time for John Rabino of dollarcollapse.com. John, we got some questions to answer and some irate people because you confused several Italian names and gave a misleading impression that, I don't know, that the Italian government's unstable? <laughs> Hey, Carrie. Well, that's not a misleading impression. The Italian <laughs> government will always be unstable because that's the nature of that culture. But I did say that uh, when they were negotiating uh, the the people who were going to be in the new government in Italy, that the uh, the president had rejected the coalition party's choice for premier. But he had actually rejected the choice for finance minister. Um and, and for a while, it looked like they were not going to be able to put the government together and there was going to be a new election, but they, they managed it. And the guy who was rejected is now in the cabinet, but in a different position from finance minister. So sorry about that. It is hard to keep track of these things. The, uh, uh, the way other countries negotiate the creation of a government is, is so different from the way it works in the U.S. that uh, – <laughs> that it's, it's fun to watch, but it's hard to follow. <laughs> so, yeah, well, we in the U.S., it makes so much more sense because, look, Donald Trump is president, right? Yeah, yeah, and he <laughs> picks the cabinet. <laughs> yeah, and that's and then, that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all done. So you have at least a cohesive, in theory, a cohesive government for four years, whereas in, in Europe, with all these parliamentary systems, you have these flash elections, like in Canada, your government there is good for five years, but at any time the government can call a, a snap election and they can vote them in for another five years. So it's a minimum five year term, but then it becomes a confidence election, a reconfirmation election almost, and they could keep going and going until the people get fed up with them, which seems to happen more and more lately because Justin from Justin from Canada is is an interesting caricature of progressivism and liberalism and person kind in, with all of its flaws. So we got a letter here from uh, Jesse and Jesse says, love your program. All Bessie and I listen all the time. Question for John is understanding the causes of the Great Depression, wealth gap, credit creation, overages, wild ass speculation, central poor central bank decision making. What are the differences or similarities in the depression we face that could generate a different outcome for the middle class? Is this time potentially not different? And in what ways? Well, it's probably different, although, you know, a lot of the stuff leading up to it is the same. But um, back then, gold was money. Money was gold. So you you didn't have the potential for a hyperinflation where a, where a country just decides to borrow as, as much as it needs to and then just finances its ever increasing debt with newly created currency. You can't do that under a gold standard. Um, you can do it under a fiat currency standard. So that's the big difference. Right now, we have less of a, um, a deflation potential out there. Although, a mountain of debt is very deflationary. Um, but the the potential for this thing to spin out of control is on the inflationary side, probably because governments are taking that kind of action. As, as soon as things start to slow down a bit, you see more QV and, and um, greater money creation and lower interest rates. And without a doubt, we will see that again next time. You know, we'll have a recession in the not too distant future because we're eight or nine years into a recovery and um, stock prices are at record levels and bond prices are still pretty close to record levels and house prices are at record levels. In other words, we're, we're late in the cycle and the cycle will turn and we'll have a recession and you'll see governments respond to that, not with austerity, but with massive new money creation. And that creates the conditions in which 
you have a currency crisis as the, the relief valve. In other words, if governments are controlling interest rates, which would normally be the way the markets react to massive currency creation, um, you, you will see a plunge in the value of the currencies that are being overinflated. So that I think is a real danger out there that this time around, currency values fall. We have a currency crisis that takes the uh, the tools of monetary policy away from central banks. Because if your currency is falling, you can't really save yourself by creating new currency. That just makes it worse. And that's probably what we're looking at out there. Uh, in the depression, that wasn't an issue because since gold was money, money actually got more valuable during the course of the decade. Um, so I, I think it's a good chance that what's coming is going to be a lot more chaotic than just a debt driven depression. This is going to be what you see in Argentina or someplace or Venezuela where, where things just totally spin out of control. And the currency is the, the, the focal point of the crisis, um, which means that you protect yourself with real assets when the, the thing that we measure the price of real assets is, um, is distorted by bad monetary policy, then real assets are the thing to own because they go up relative to those bad currencies. So this scenario leads you back to gold and silver as a way to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. So this time is going to be different because we're not on a gold standard, at least theoretically, but we went off the gold standard during the last Great Depression. So here they've just been printing away or attempting to print away your problems and eventually that just creates more problems and compounds the situation, right? Yeah, well, we, we stayed on a gold standard in the US, although we devalued um, by making gold illegal to own and then Private, calling yeah. a bunch of it in and then changing the, the price relative to the dollar. But we, we still had a connection to gold that made it hard just to print huge amounts of new currency. Um, this time around, we don't have anything like that. And these guys are basically in charge of, uh, you know, unlimited credit cards. They, they are able to create as much new currency as they want to and human nature being what it is, that's what they're doing. So that's the difference between then and now. And it's a, a an inflationary difference so, that leads us yeah. to, um, you know, to protect ourselves with inflation hedges. All right. So this reminds me of a story I read recently on the web, of course, that I have every reason to believe is actually true. And it's entitled, um, 24 year old, 24 year old Australian man spent $2 million, um, <laughs> in, in like a year and a half. And it was called, it was written in Esquire magazine and it's entitled when Milky got his money. And I will put a link to that in the show notes. And what this kid did, he had a house and he just, uh, he had a mortgage account and he would transfer the payment from his savings account to pay his mortgage. And one time he didn't have enough money in the account and he just did it anyway. And they, and they, it went through no calls, no nothing. And he said, gee, that's interesting. So he kept doing it and doing it. And without boring you with all the details, he found himself, um, I think this is in, in Australia. Yeah. He found himself like on the gold coast to uh, $2 million in Hawk. And the next thing he knows he's arrested and, and he's convicted. He's going to go to jail and he appeals it. And they all said, you're nuts. You can't win. You can't win. Well, it turns out that the bank knowingly approved his overdrafts. I mean, not knowingly, but they just approved them. It required a human being to intervene and approve the overdraft, and they kept doing it. And as a result, there was no deceit involved or anything else. There was no embezzlement. He just asked for an overdraft, and they gave it to him. And he was transferring the money into his PayPal account after he paid off his mortgage with all the overdrafts. Then he sold the house. Then he says, well, I need an account to put the money into, but it has to be a debit type account. It can't be a bank account. So he figures out that he can transfer overdrafts into PayPal and he runs up $2 million and was in jail, but eventually beat the rap. And guess what he's going to do now, John? What? Just take a wild guess. 
Declare bankruptcy? No, no, because the bank has said, oh, I didn't tell you. The bank said we're not going to chase you for the deficiency because we effectively they got such bad publicity. They want to forget that this thing ever happened. No, uh, Milky is in law school now because he won the unwinnable case. And now he's very full of himself and thinks he can work this magic uh, on others' behalfs. Hmm. <laughs> well... You, you know, a, I have a line of credit yeah. on my checking account. I yeah. wonder if the same thing. Would I don't work. think they'll keep. <laughs> I don't think they'll let you run up to two million. But I think he's making a big mistake, because any idiot could be a lawyer. Look, I was. I think that he should become a central banker. Yeah, well, that is a pretty good metaphor for central banking in today's <laughs> world, where everybody has effectively an unlimited credit card. Yeah, or all governments do at least. Don't so. you think? Yeah, yeah, I um, think. I think he's... it's a question of degree <laughs> rather than um, quality of hey. action. You know, he just did something a little more extreme than what lots of people are out there doing right now. But kind of brilliant, though, huh? That he beat well, the rap representing yeah. himself. You know, that's the amazing part. He beat the rap. It just doesn't work <laughs> that way, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I think the central bankers maybe could learn a little something from Milky, too, because the key is like to. He blew through the money. I mean, they recaptured whatever he owned. He had been ripped off by a friend, took 150000 It doesn't matter. The point is that the guy, you know, not only did he, he get to enjoy the spoils of his, of his efforts for quite a while, for like a couple of years, but then turn around, once they were on to him, he beat them in court. And he was right. He was totally right on the law. But sometimes it takes a non-lawyer to see what a lawyer can't see. That's the moral of the story. Anyways, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so central banker, um, I think uh, maybe Powell could hire him as a personal assistant. When the debt's getting a little too big and it's starting to threaten things, just send in Mikey. Or Milky. <laughs> Send in Milky. Milky will handle it. Milky will save us, right? <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, John, you know? And it's just like our central bankers. They're on a binge. They'll never be able to pay it back. And, uh, you know, they'll look for uh, they'll look for Milky to, to put things in order, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the, that is the big question. What happens when we can't pay our debts back anymore? Mm -hmm. And that's out there somewhere. Actually, Carrie, there, there's an interesting uh, kind of corollary to that, that uh, the Wall Street Journal just published today about how uh, value oriented investors are just dying out there because the there, there's so much money sloshing around in the system. It's, it's pouring into hot tech stocks and widening the gap between value investing and um, and basically speculation, which is, you know, what, what you get when you're when you're buying growth stocks at these levels. And how money managers who have a value orientation are faced with extinction or adaptation where they start buying um, tech stocks, too. And and that's a, a really interesting late cycle um, kind of phenomenon that you see at the peaks of, of cycles when um, when value investing doesn't work anymore. And when value investors start either going bust or changing their stripes and becoming growth investors. And that, that's yet another um, sign that we're at the end of this cycle, because that's the kind of thing that happens right at the peak of cycles. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the, the turn is coming at some point in the not too distant future where these valuations just don't work anymore. And whether the uh, whether the impact is mainly felt in the bond market or the stock market or real estate, is unclear right now, but we we are in kind of a 2006, 2007, 2008 environment right now where things aren't working anymore. And you're seeing people who, you know, 20 or 30 years in, in the business of, of value investing who are now buying Netflix or something like that. Yeah. And that's that's a sign that we're towards the end here. So there, there are a lot of signs like that. Uh, but this is a new one and it's an interesting one. It's that old, uh, if you can't beat them, join them kind of capitulation. It's a bad sign and it's not going to end well. You can be sure of that. But hey, you know what, John? We could be totally wrong. This thing could go on for two or three years more, maybe longer, because a trend in motion continues until it stops, right? Well, 
this has gone on a lot longer than it should have. <laughs> right. Exactly. In, in, point. In, in both kinds of um, scales, you know, it should, the whole thing should have fallen apart in 2008. And this cycle within the, the bigger super cycle probably shouldn't have lasted this long either uh, based on valuations. And the, the difference this time is that we've got central banks creating immense amounts of new currency out there. The U.S. is tightening a little bit, but a lot of other central banks are still really loose. You know, Japanese, yeah. uh, the Japanese central bank and, and to an extent the European central bank and definitely the Chinese central bank are all still creating a lot of new currency and tossing it out into the global financial system. This money has to go somewhere, so it's going into hot assets. Yeah. But again valuations do matter at some point. Oh, I and wasn't aware we, of that. we're at the point where they that. mattered in the past. <laughs> I didn't know that, John. I thought yeah. uh, as long as momentum carries you, then everything is fine and don't worry about it. Just get in and get out as fast as you can uh, with your scalp intact. Yeah. Well, that is the way it feels towards the end of a, a bubble. But in retrospect, you always end up looking back and going, oh, my God, I should have shorted all of this stuff. I shouldn't have owned any of it, you know, mm -hmm. at that peak in that month on that day. And we don't know what the, the month of the day will be, but we know that there will be one. There, there, there will be a time when we look back and say, OK, that was the time to bail and to start shorting this market really aggressively. Mm -hmm. uh, we might be there. Or as you said, it might be a while longer. I don't know, but we're we're at valuation levels, which in the past have been the levels where you really wanted to short this market like crazy. Yeah, I, I know, and it's dangerous. But look, when you see when you see companies like Tesla literally going to the moon, no pun intended. Yes, pun intended. Then you really you really got to. You got to look at this thing and say, uh, maybe, just maybe something not so good is going to happen here and and get ready for the inevitability here. Right. Well, th that's the sad thing for value oriented money managers is that they uh, a lot of the time they'll start switching gears and in order to survive, start buying growth stocks just at the time when their original strategy was the best thing to do. You know, they, mm -hmm. they had they stayed with their growth stock or with their um, their value stock strategy, they would have outperformed for the next four or five years when the cycle turns down. But a lot of them get caught at the very peak in desperation, switching to the thing that's not going to work going forward. And it's 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 sad because it's. Um, a result of government distorting markets in ways that make it impossible for people looking at actual fundamentals to invest correctly. And so it's it's not the, um, the money manager's fault and it's not individual investors' fault when they get sucked into these bubbles. It's government's fault for trying to inflate away their debts and in the process distorting the market price signaling mechanism and making capitalism not work anymore. Yeah. Uh, that's what we've been doing for going on 40 years now. And it gets worse in each cycle. This, this cycle is just astoundingly bad. Yeah, and madness. so probably the consequences of the, the mistakes we're making now are going to be horrendous when the time comes. I can only imagine. And you can only imagine too. And look, uh, we just keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again, but it seems like the magnitude of the mistakes are what are what is increasing. We don't learn anything from it. And I just wonder what would have happened in 08, 09 if they put the banks into conservatorship, split them up and let the chips fall, fall where they may, eliminate government backing from residential real estate, get rid of all the corporate welfare in the in the budget and get rid of all the welfare where we would be today. Uh, you know, actually oh, we would be so much healthier today if we'd done that. It would have been worse though at the bottom. You know that it would have been worse at the bottom. Well, that's why they didn't do it Yeah, because they would have gotten blamed for what, what would have felt like an ongoing depression mm -hmm. because it would have taken a few extra years for all of this stuff to get liquidated. And yes. uh, well, you know what Iceland did, though? I, I, Iceland is just a few hundred thousand people, so it's not always a, a great easier. example. But they, they had a huge banking crisis. 
And they put the bankers in jail. They protected bank depositors. So they didn't let the little guy um, get in, get wiped out by the mm -hmm. crisis. Uh, and, and then they imposed new rules on the banks. And they're a pretty healthy country right now. Yeah. And they, they got through it in relatively good shape. Oh, and they stiffed their um, foreign creditors. So the, the people who had lent them a lot of money, um, they had to take some losses. And, mm -hmm. and it worked. So had we done something like Iceland did, we'd be in way better shape now. We wouldn't have doubled our debt or quadrupled our debt, exactly. depending on which section of our, our uh, balance sheet you're looking at. And we wouldn't be facing a crisis which, just based on the numbers, is potentially a lot worse than 2008, 2009. It's frightening. It's really yeah. frightening what it could turn into. And it is. I know. And you, which, yeah. You know, we're the stopped uh, clock brigade here. But the fact is, uh, it potentially is going to be far worse than anything imaginable, you know, than anything that we could have ever dreamed in our wildest dreams or nightmares. Right. It really could be really bad. Well, for, for the people who are trusting the powers that be right now. Yeah, it could be very bad because if, if all your savings are in the local fiat currency or bonds that pay you in the local fiat currency, when the inevitable inevitable monetary reset happens, in other words, the only way out for these guys is to devalue their currencies really aggressively one way or another, uh, that hurts you, that impoverishes you. So a lifetime of savings evaporates. That's yes. gonna be terrible. Uh, the people who own real stuff, might come through it in reasonably good shape and le unless governments decide on some kind of a windfall profits tax and, and they want to share the pain by also sharing the benefits accruing to the people who made the right decisions. You know, that, that we can't know. But um, looking just at which asset classes will do well versus which won't, you definitely want to be as far away from these fiat currencies as, as possible and as deeply into real assets that will be protected from this when it comes. Very important. Anyway, John, that's it for this week. Make sure you check out John's work over at dollarcollapse.com. Sign up for his newsletter. We get it. It gives you the latest update on newly re released uh, articles. Hey, check out financialsurvivalnetwork.com. New newsletter coming out uh, within the next 24 hours, I promise. And I'm writing an article that I hope is going to really inspire you to do your best to be the greatest person you can be. And the, the example might be a little controversial, but the wisdom isn't. And look, send us emails. We, as you see, we answer everything. I'm going to start answering a lot of them on the show from now on. We'll even do shows devoted to answering your questions. And the email address for your personal reference is kl at kerrylutz.com. Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz. And the Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. John, till next week. Thanks, Kerry. See ya. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.